Well, that was quick, wasn't it? <laughs> Welcome to a Prehistory Guys uh, question time Q and A. Um, Speak for a moment, Rupert, because I'm getting echo. ferocious yes, sorry, echo. Folks. Yes. Uh, I thought that was throwing me completely. Yes, well, welcome to the first uh, Q&A of 2021. Uh, I think I've cured it. it it's, uh, it's always very confusing. No, I've still got it. Um, that's probably me. Um, I can't, I can't I, hear. Sorry, folks. I've, uh, I've got, so his voice and my voice continuing after. I hope you've only got it once, but um, I'm going to uh, quit something else. So... Uh, in the meantime, yes, welcome to the first Q&A of 2021. And we've got some great questions this evening. Yeah, we really have, uh, haven't we? There's such a range here of questions to, to answer. We're going to, you know, you'll be suffering from whiplash after this uh, show, the areas that we're going to and uh, crossing the continents with, I suppose. I don't know. We'll see what, uh, what shows up. So thanks to all of you that have uh, posed questions. We're really looking forward to answering them. And... Rather than, you know, making a, a state of the nation address, as we often uh, tend to do at the beginning of these shows, we don't need we to. Do. We did that last night. If you haven't seen it, we did a whole um, show about uh, the background to what we're doing and, and what our plans are, um, how our plans are going to turn out in uh, 2021 last night so it's the last thing on our timeline so if you haven't seen it check it out if you're interested in um, finding you know if you're new to us and uh, um, don't know what much about what we're up to and uh, what we're going to be up to so uh, yeah. yeah I can't think of anything else to really put in there except if you haven't already done so uh, like and subscribe and uh, do check out our uh, our Patreon page if you've, you've got a moment before we proceed unless you've got other things that uh, you think we need to mention Rupert before we actually get underway well as you say I think we did all that last night um, yeah. and uh, yeah I mean live Q&A it is what it says on the tin um, yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, and I, I hope those of you that uh, sent questions in are, are, are with us uh, already this evening, because um, mm, mm, mm. yeah, there were some nice questions, some uh, some unusual questions tonight as well, which yeah, yeah, is yeah. Uh, which is always good. It's terrific because you're always keeping us on our toes, and I think I said this last time. But the fantastic thing, you know, never thought of this as a as, as, as a as a positive uh, thing of of doing the Q and A's is that it uh, expands our horizons as well because we get questions, of course, uh, about things we uh, not come across our uh, horizons before, and so we uh, we usually well, do have to. Sometimes when we have, and uh, and it's just we actually haven't joined those particular dots before. It's only when somebody says, uh, you know, mm -hmm. what do you know about this? It's like, oh, well, yeah, I hadn't actually yeah, put yeah, it in yeah. this context before, but now that you ask. Mm. So anyway, if you're new to us here, if you're watching uh, a, a new tonight, um, this is our regular Tuesday night, eight o'clock, uh, second Tuesday in the month, is it? that we uh, peg it to, um, where we answer questions that yes. have been posted by uh, our subscribers and other people during the uh, previous uh, month. So, before I do that, I will say a big hello, because I recognise an awful lot of names in the chat going on there. We'll do our best to keep up with you folks, but thanks, as ever. It's amazing. My goodness gracious me. I don't know. I, would you still be turning up if we were doing every, this every single night? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know but we, we are honoured. We are honoured by your, your presence and your uh, enthusiasm. And uh, with that, I think we had uh, we better get on with the show, hadn't we? Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm going to point out to anybody who doesn't know that I haven't even got the pull out uh, chat, so I uh, I'm not distracted by anything. <laughs> Well you, don't have, I, uh, you, well, you can go and get it if you want. I can. <laughs> I closed it because while I was fumbling around, that's what was completely throwing me off because I was listening to us as if we were four people echoing around. And oh, sorry, you've cured that, have you? That, that's why I was staring at you blankly, folks, because <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing more distracting than hearing yourself talking. And Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, mm. most of us wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but... Um, 
<laughs> oh, if, if anybody's wondering, I haven't developed a nervous tick or anything like that. If you see me, me going like this uh, up here, it's because me uh, in-ear phones are, are slipping out and uh, yes. I can't hear things properly. Anyway, that's enough about us. Shall we move to the first question, Rupert? Go on then. Okay. This question is from The Mighty One. The I'm mighty afraid, one I, I don't know who The Mighty One is. If you're here, let yourself be known. Um, but it's a really interesting question to kick off with, isn't it? What mm. do you guys think is the most interesting period of prehistory? Well... <laughs> We couldn't do that. We couldn't answer that question from an objective point of view because declaring what we think is the most interesting period of prehistory um, would be a little bit arrogant, I think. Don't you? Jurassic. <laughs> what, do you think we should be doing a, pod, uh, a YouTube sh show about dinosaurs? We, I mean, you know, we do well do, doing that. Yeah. But it's, um, um, it's impossible to pick one, isn't it? Really, there are certain various, certainly various things uh, in, uh, let's say, the Holocene. You know, you know the, the foibles of people. Uh, there are so many interesting periods where it would be so nice to be able to see what was actually going on. Uh, you know, the, the repeopling of of Britain, if you like, the complete genetic transformation. Um, in uh, you know the 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 Neolithic um, transition, and you mm. know how did that happen? What on earth caused that? It would be amazing to find that. And uh, and the first megalith builders, you know, who was it that said, "Let's do this," which is such a ridiculous thing to do. Let's move well, hundred think, ton lumps around. Yeah, you're answering the question. You know, you know. I think that's the way we would answer it from our myopic, uh, subjective um, point yeah. of view. But it's very interesting yeah. seeing what's coming up in in the in in the chat chat because it, it's so diverse. Um, uh, uh, Matt says just before the Roman occupation of Britain. Mm. Follow, follow. <laughs> yeah. Tim says bloody Romans. <laughs> what the Romans have <laughs> done for us? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, younger Dryas. Um, yeah, you see, see what I mean. I think the the clue, though, for us, the giveaway for us is that you know, uh, the, it's in the title of the film. It's in the title of the film of Standing with Stones, and it's in the you know, and the title of the podcast as we had it for uh, mm. uh, quite a, a long time. Is I think. Uh, you know what inspires us most, what has us go to books and um, movies and and lectures and, and so on and so forth, is finding out about what Rupert just uh, said. You know uh, the uh, that transition, or oh, the transitions, I should say. You know from the Mesolithic to the Neolithic and the Neolithic to uh, to the Bronze Age. Yeah. Um, and uh, what was going on in there. And, you know, there are so many enigmas in that period. As far as, far as you know, Britain is concerned, you know, it seems, and now it seems as we've spread our areas of interest a bit more, you know, the same enigmas were actually occurring on the continent uh, as well. But there seemed to be something very particular to us, about, you know, about the enigma of megaliths on, in Britain and, and mm. the rest of it. And I think, you know, whether that's true or not, that's the, our stepping off point. And uh, what has got, um, got into stuff to, uh, well, <laughs> to risk answering a question that will be coming up later on. Mm. So yeah, that's our subjective answer, um, but uh, we wouldn't dare to prescribe what should be <laughs> the most interesting period of, uh, of prehistory. No, yeah. no. I mean, it's because every time you think of something that is uh, a mysterious aspect, so I, you know, it could even be the amount that people travelled. You know, we yeah. know from from trade routes, for example, we know that people travelled a lot. And it was, well, you know, what was that in terms of, uh, of it being a social norm? You know, I mean, what percentage of a population travelled a lot? Or was mm, it just that mm. there were a handful of traders in a larger um, social group who would go all over yeah. the place? Or, 
Um, you know, well, it's kind extraordinary of thing, I mean, we, when you look at the distances. Yeah. We can dive down into that kind of thing in in, uh, in many ages, and the fascinating thing mm. is because there isn't any history; it's uh, it's ripe for exercising our imaginations. Mm. Um, uh, you know, Christopher's mum says the Iron Age because it is the era mm -hmm. that we could understand from our timeline, and uh, mm. you know, in many respects, that is. Right, you know, and we have the advantage of the Romans having written about what they met at the end, you know, <laughs> at yeah. the end of, of the Iron Age, you know. So there's some sort of record, at least, of what people were up to uh, um, before mm. before all change. Yeah. So I think we've answered that question, and uh, been, it's it's been interesting to see what your answer, your ideas are as well in the chat there, because. It tells us that, you know, in our broadening out of uh, stuff we do, um, that we've been on the right lines in doing so, you know? Mm -hmm. There are so many um, broad areas. Anyway, yeah, Geraldine says, Neolithic to Bronze Age, yeah. Anyway, shall we move on to mm -hmm. a question from uh, Stone Age Steve, who um, wants to know... Uh, Cairns, suffering in the British Isles, are there any similarities in their size or are they random? Do they reflect how much someone was revered, perhaps, rocks placed by individuals paying respect? Question mark. So, mm. yeah, a question about the size of Cairns and what they reflect. What does, it, what does, this, does the size of a Cairn possibly have uh, any meaning? Well, the, there's a couple of points that Steve has put in the question, which narrow the mm -hmm. parameters. Number one, he says in the British Isles. Yeah. And number two, uh, he says rocks placed by individuals paying respects, which means he's talking about a very specific kind of cairn. Yeah. Um, because, you know, cairn, <laughs> cairn is, uh, is, is not really an exacting term. Uh, you know, it can apply to all sorts of mounds. But if you're talking about rocks placed mm. by individuals paying respect, then th there is a huge variety. Yes. Can I just uh, stop you a moment? I just want to say to Marcus, uh, who I, uh, a name I don't recognise, but I thought I'd just better say, because he's, he's just asked a very interesting question in the chat here. He says, what do you think about the connection between the Langdale Axe Factory and Castle Rig? That's a great question, but I'm afraid we can't answer it now. We, we may come back to it if we've got time, but we have to um, uh, focus on questions that have been uh, asked in the last uh, month, I'm afraid, Marcus. But thank yeah, you so do. much for the question. It's great to see you here. We'll see if we yes, can come and, back to and, that. And, and also, Marcus, if we, if we don't have time to come back to that tonight, then uh, when we put the next call for questions up, Stick it on that, and we'll answer it. Um, we'll answer it next month, in the next show. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, oh, and mm -hmm. big thank you to uh, Broken One Three Nine Four for uh, your super chat there, and uh, from Pixie Piano Player. We're getting round to you, Pixie. Later on, you've got a question coming up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry I interrupted, but it's important to acknowledge. Uh, folk, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, uh, British Isles and Cairns that are accumulations of stones. Uh, across the British Isles, there are cairns of every different shape and, well, not shape, but sizes so varied. I think, obviously, no, I can't say obviously, the biggest of all. Maves Cairn in uh, County Sligo. Oh uh, goodness! It's uh, it's absurdly vast. Um, uh, how many uh, uh, has anybody put a uh, put a figure of an, an estimated weight of stones <laughs> on that? It's just you know it, it's a mountain of uh, of, of stones um, over. Uh, <laughs> We don't actually know how old that burial might be, and uh, we don't know who's in it either. They call it Maeve's Cairn, but it predates the, the Iron Age Maeve that we know about by a long yeah. way. Important, so that's the Eric, Vaughan, Eric Vaughan finally made it to a live. You're very oh, well welcome, done, sir. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to see um, you. 
But you've also got um, Cairns from, uh, you know, dotted around. I mean, whether it's uh, Dartmoor or uh, Bodmin Moor, there's a few um, places where people have piled up stones. Now, um, whether they were actually related to burials or not is not always clear, but some of them are as small as not even 10 feet across or, you know, three metres across. Some of them, you go up into the high Brecon beacons and there are cairns up there that are probably 10 metres, 30 feet across um, yeah. and, you know, 10 feet tall, that sort of mm -hmm. size, mm -hmm. big, you know. It doesn't seem to and, be a and Well, size. by mentioning oh. the size of stuff, you address part of uh, Stone Age Steve's question because kicking off with Maeve's cairn, it's called a cairn, mm. and it mm. looks like a cairn, you know, it's round in uh, plan view and it's pyramid-shaped because it's formed by the natural slope of the Is stones that make view? it up. Is it round in plan view? I thought it was elongated. Pretty much. Uh, well, uh, maybe, maybe so. Oh, yeah, you may. I think it's elongated at the top having stood on the top, but but I don't know about the, the base. You may have a point. But to, I, the only way I can tell you about Maeve's Cairn to give us a sense of size is uh, ascending the, what is it, 30, 35 degrees, 40 degrees slope of it. Take, mm, to cool. get to the top yeah. takes about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That long, didn't you? No, maybe yeah, not. Yeah, I mean, a huge. slight exaggeration, but um, yeah, I've got film of huge. you doing it, so yeah, it, you have. it yes. takes a long time, and it's a slog getting up it. Now the point is, not each of those stones was brought by someone who revered Maeve. Well, they're still that, doing it now. That we, <laughs> yeah, but to create the cairn in the first place was an industrial, large-scale operation. Yes. Uh, there, there wasn't there wasn't to be much time for reverence in the placing of the stones, otherwise they'd still be building it, is my point. Again, mm. slightly exaggerated, but you, you know, I think I've made it. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it's, uh, it's, um, it is an interesting uh, point though because we, we we can only make guesses ab about intent um you know obviously if it's a really huge can that it's going to be important for whatever reason and it might be because that particular social group wanted to look bigger and more flamboyant than their neighbors or it might be that they wanted to revere that, that particular person that much? We don't know. It's a guess. Mm, mm, mm. Um, I, I wish you could see the uh, comments, uh, Rupert. If you can rustle them up for yourself, it's useful because people I've, are making um, some interesting I've, points. And either Otherwise, I have to keep interrupting you to, um, you know, if people are making um, pertinent comments about the, the question in, in, uh, in train. I've, you know, I feel, um, I've actually got it open now in uh, okay. I mean, um, in e uh, For I example, Juan Juan says all. hard to make a Juan says hard to make a pile of rubble too big before it just topples. Um, but you, well, but that's you why they all seem to have a common uh, a, a shape, common slope because common slope. It's the, yes. it's the natural slip. But it um, but so it doesn't but hinder right, the actual yeah. size. They'll always assume the you know the same uh, angle of slope, mm. uh, Juan. But there can be uh, pretty much any size you like, of course. And you, you've got a law of diminishing returns on the amount of stones you put in. It, you could put a thousand more stones on the uh, you know, or ten thousand more stones. On May's can, it wouldn't make the slightest bit of difference. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> it, it really wouldn't. Yeah. No. <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, Janet asks, how do we know if the size of a can is now the same as it was when it was built? Uh, well, that's it. We don't. Um, we, we don't. Uh, no. you, you, can, you can make certain uh, presumptions, I suppose. Um, because the the thing is that if if you were going to uh, put it another way, if you're building another site, so you know one of the reasons that so many sites have disappeared over the thousands of years is because people have robbed the stones to uh, you know to reuse them in in other building 
uh, sites. Well, if you're going to take somewhere like Maves Cairn, uh, we keep using it as an example. So I, I, I hope you know what we're talking about. And if you don't, then do Google it. Um, uh, yeah, but, Maves um, Cairn, Ca County Sligo um, overlooking yeah, the yeah. coast. Um, to, some, it's Atlantic. sometimes referred to as Maeve's Grave as well um, for a bit mm -hmm. of alliteration. But, um, it's, um, you know, if you were going to rob stones to, um, uh, to build something else, then you would take the stones from the bottom. You wouldn't go up to the top and steal from the top and then take them all the way down again. Yeah. So, um, so the height, um, it's not altered that much. It's not practical to take that kind of stone, to be honest. If, you know, it's, it's a lot of work to carry away a stone that's not that big. There's, yeah. you know, the, it, they're more easily accessible lower down the hill. You know? But one way of knowing, Janet, is that a lot of cairns have curbstones, uh, which describe the perimeter. Um, so using uh, Matt Lazzy's uh, collapse angle uh, theory mm. there, uh, well, not la not Matt's theory. Some <laughs> mm. uh, it, it is known that, that the collapse angle is you can't build anything of loose material um, to exceed an angle of forty degrees. So when mm. you've got those, you know, a size of a uh, ring of curbstones and the forty degree rule, uh, then you mm. can uh, you can tell whether something's uh, uh, One diminished of the things over that, time. Um, uh, uh, that um, something that was done, particularly this um, in Ireland, there's a couple of instances I can think of where um, a cairn was actually turfed. Um, so rather than filled in with earth mm -hmm. and then grass planted on it, they actually turfed it mm -hmm. so that it, uh, it, it, gave more integrity to the stones and of course that's uh, that's long since eroded away but they can tell from uh, from what remains from careful analysis they can tell that it was mm. It, mm. it was actually turfed rather than just simply soil covered yeah. uh, which is interesting that does give you a, a specific size as michael said you know when you've got curb stones then you can tell but uh, but even you know going back to steve's um question though you know that is there any commonality in sizes now they're all over the place um, yes <laughs> huge varieties uh, yeah, yeah. huge yeah. varieties i mean you know on dartmoor you describe that uh, little kissed thing it's a can it's tiny you know it's it's that size yeah so the, by... so the mound covering that wouldn't wouldn't have been um, necessarily big yeah, yeah. at all Yes, it, it's uh, it's um, you'll know what I mean if you've seen the uh, standing with stones and, and the, uh, the bit where we traverse Dartmoor. Mm. Yes, or where Rupert I'm traverses sorry. Dartmoor. <laughs> Obviously, I traversed Dartmoor as well, but you know. yeah, he was there. <laughs> he was. Uh, I don't think there's anything more we can say about that. Uh, Martin says uh, before Caledonia. Oh. Before I say before Caledonia, check out before Caledonia because Martin runs another YouTube uh, channel and he does excellent films about the monuments of Scotland. So yes, he does. if you're looking at the before, click through uh, on uh, before Caledonia's link and have a look around there. Don't go away from here, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Up to you, you choose. Yeah. But anyway, as Martin says, lots of cairns were robbed for building walls. Lots. Mm. Lots of monuments, lots of stone circles were robbed for building walls. Uh, on that note, though, I think we'll move on, shall we? Go on, Thank you uh, for the question, Thanks. Steve. I haven't seen you in the chat yet. I hope you're lurking about or if you get to see this later. Curious Celt, I know you're here. <laughs> How did the Neolithic people measure or quantify distance? Wow. Yes. <sighs> Uh, no idea. <laughs> yeah, moving. no idea. But it's a great talking point, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it's a huge question because, um, uh, uh, well, okay, we could talk about the megalithic yard, which, um, I mean, whilst there, well, are we could. People, we, <laughs> yes, we're not going to. Um, well, we are but, a little bit. You know, 
<laughs> well, well, whilst there are still lots of people who uh, who refute its existence, you know, they think that yeah. uh, Alexander Tom, who came up with this uh, this measure that seemed to apply to so many sites, uh, people, some people dismiss it. I think it's unreasonable to dismiss it completely because it's very compelling, and they must have, you know, there are so many commonalities to things that, um, you know. They must have had some way of measuring. You can't do complex geometry without measure, and um, and there are too many instances of complex geometry uh, that we know about. So they must have had measure. Um, <clears throat> what could we talk about in terms of measure? We could talk about the Falkton drums. We're going to talk about those later. Um, well, just uh, to, I mean, my my take on the megalithic yard is, is this, uh, and that it. Um, what Tom did was reverse engineering of a set of uh, a set of data that he uh, accumulated, you know, by measurement mm. and painstaking, painstaking measurement, hats off and all that to the amount of work that he actually did. But it was reverse engineering, but of a lot of numbers. Mm. And um, anybody you know that visited a megalithic site, you think where with accuracy can I measure from where to where? If I'm going to take a measurement here. What am I going to measure from? What am I going to measure to? So the aggregate of uh, uh, of these numbers has got to be it's sort of reasonably arbitrary. And if you're looking for a number to pop out of the statistics of those those numbers, boom! Is it really a surprise that the number that pops out is approximate to a lengthy uh, of a, of a stride of a long stride? Mm. If anybody's measuring out anything they don't just walk normally they take a, a you know a a lengthy stride to try to no matter what their height build or whatever to approximate somebody else's stride so you've got a little bit of consistency so i'm not at all surprised mm. that that number what is the number um i think i've got it here somewhere the actual measure of uh, the actual yard. measure it's at 2.72 feet mm. yeah i could i could do that as a stride but i i don't i don't think uh, I, I i on balance i i reject it myself actually i'll tell you what i've got an interesting uh, quote here from clive uh, ruggles the uh, oh, um, the yeah yeah the uh, archaeoastronomy guy, or the only archaeoastronomy guy that's got a university position in archaeoastronomy, isn't? Am I not right? I think there are Probably. one or two maybe coming up. But this, um, <clears throat> Clive Ruggles, citing the summer Douglas C. Hege, has said that both classical and Bayesian statistical reassessments of Tom's data reached the conclusion that the evidence in favour of the megalithic yard was at best marginal that even if it does exist, the uncertainty in our knowledge of its value is of the order of a centimetre is far greater than the one millimetre precision claimed by Tom. In other words, the evidence presented by Tom could be adequately explained by, say, monuments being set out by pacing with the unit reflecting an average length of pace. Mm. And I, I yeah. <clears throat> mm. So uh, that, that's uh, what I, that's what I, I take uh, from it but mm. that said just, sorry Rupert where are you going no sorry right. I was just going to say but <laughs> then look at uh, what Howard Crowhurst says and um, yes uh, is that where well, you were uh, going? explain explain uh, Howard Crowhurst then Howard Crowhurst is a Brit living in France uh, who has been studying Karnak in Brittany, uh, in northern France, he's been studying the alignments of all the stones there, which to me never looked particularly accurate at all. And yet he has illustrated a geometry within them that I can't argue with his findings in any way. Uh, I find it disturbing because... Uh, I still think that if they've got that level of accuracy, then it would be tidier. But you can't well, argue with what he illustrates. So, mm. yeah, to be honest, to our strapline of digging deeper, it is a bullet we're going to have to bite. 
and actually <laughs> get. <laughs> We are. Um, we are at that, some point. That. I, I, I do want to, uh, you know, we've said it before and I'll say it again. Uh, I do want to make the distinction, though, that that in in our work, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say this any, anymore What with, um, you know, um, political correctness these days, but I've always said that we're interested in the... Uh, uh, the evolution of man, not the foibles of men, and uh, and so when you get, uh, you know, the specifics of how this particular site was measured and calculated and what have you, that it is interesting in terms of the site itself, but it doesn't tell you anything about humanity. Yeah. Um, and so you know, there's, uh, I'm I'm very wary of. A sort of embarking on a project that would genuinely be years of research just to tell you how people manage to calculate such and such to make this site or you, do you know what i mean it doesn't actually take you yeah. anywhere significant in terms of humanity i don't yeah, think yeah, yeah but but i think i think i i, I, <coughs> I, I find it challenging from an understanding point of view you know from mm -hmm. somebody that does approach it from uh, the mathematical angle and and has the math to be able to say but you can't mm. throw that because this that and the other i want Indeed. to be able to understand that and there is saying there is something going on um at mm. uh, karnak so one day we'll get round to having a look at that the other thing i would say before we sort of leave the um, the, the point about measurement is measurement, you're quite right to ask the question because measurement is a very, very powerful thing, especially if you're expecting to uh, do trade with people, uh, if you're expecting to um, exchange uh, stuff with people in any way whatsoever. And, and measure is not the, the least of the problems. I played with the idea, didn't get anywhere at all. Um, I, I, I'm thinking sometimes that maybe the fascination with the heavens and the, uh, the transit to the moon, the sun, etc., uh, may be one constant that one could use, that, or that they, were, they were looking or had found a, a way of using to establish constant measure wherever you were in the world so that people could compare. That is just a wild theory. It is nothing to do with anything. That's just my thoughts. But I just wanted to plant it, see if anybody else had, thought it had had legs, if you understand um, what I mean there. Uh, all right. Um, do we need to um, uh, do any more with that, Rupert? I, 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 don't, I don't think so. I mean, uh, um, I, I, it's, we're, we're going to mention... The Fulton drums again uh, later on for another question, but yeah. it, 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 it's probably worth mentioning them briefly because uh, there's only um, a few of these. I, I can't access the picture found. of the Fulton uh, Fulton no, no, drums we'll until we come to, to that later, question. But, um, yeah, uh, but they're basically these uh, small pork pie shaped things, um, <laughs> which uh, researchers found that if you take uh, a length of uh, string and wrap it around them, then these they actually look more like weights than than length measurers. Well, that's the um, thing. But if you, if you, yes, it is the thing. And that's, we'll, we'll talk about that specifically later on. But the point is that if you wrap a length of string around the different sizes, then you get apparently an exact number of, uh, of turns around the thing. The trouble is, I, they're not straight sided. That's they right. I was going to say. I call. Bent. I call BS um, on that one. Um, I can't call it total BS, but there must be another reason for that. Well, nobody's happening. nobody's done the comparative weights of them. I haven't seen the comparative weights nor the comparative no. volumes. No, and I think uh, I think that it's the weights and volumes that are going to be more important. Yeah. Um, yeah. But unless they um, are completely meant to be enigmatic and <laughs> completely designed to mess with our poor mangled well, yeah. 21st yes, century brains. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to them later and you'll understand what we're babbling <laughs> about later on in the show. Indeed. I shall move on to uh, Pixie 
Pixie Piano Players question now, who Piano I know Pixie. is here tonight. Greetings to you. What enigmatic <laughs> artifacts have been found in situ in more oh, ancient... Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, in more ancient sites, such as Newgrange or perhaps Mays Howe in Orkney. So we've mm. got, to, got to address those things, about, particularly about Newgrange and, uh, and, and Mays Howe. Uh, but uh, brings up a whole raft of things, including <clears throat> we thought the uh, Falkton drums were a good, um, uh, good example of a bit of an enigma. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I, I, well, do you want to say anything specific about ancient sites such as Newgrange or Maze How? I because mm, no, I mean I'll go enigmatic wherever you like, but. Ar artifacts, well, we know the enigmatic thing recently that's come out of New Grange is not an artifact. It's the um, no, exactly. it's uh, not an analysis so that's uh, yeah, given us that um, uh, one mm. of the occupants that, uh, in there was the produce of an incestual relationship. That's not answering the question. I'm trying to... The, the, um, of course, you've got the stone with the famous three spirals on it in there. I don't know if that counts as uh, uh, an enigmatic uh, thing in and of itself. Uh, and the same goes, you know, there's the, the basins both in there, in Newgrange and in uh, uh, Nowth. I wonder if we'll find one in Douth. <laughs> mm. um, Maze how? I can't think of an artifact that was um, discovered in Mays Howe. I don't think there are any stone balls related to it, but there is a one enigmatic... It's not an artifact, but you've got the Viking graffiti in there. <laughs> it's not enigmatic, though, is it? No, it's not, I suppose not. an enigma. Not. I, I suppose it's, not. Uh, it's like writing on the toilet wall. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> <coughs> um, but, but we, you know, dig, digging into archives to say, well, what? Because there are so many enigmatic um, artifacts, so many. And so it was, you know, cherry picking. What are the best ones to come out with here? Because well, shall I show a picture with three balls, five balls, go or, on, or, or, yeah. or, the, or the towie? Uh, show the towie last. Last. Okay. Three balls yeah. then. Here we go. I don't know where now, particularly these, these three these, come from. Have these, you got the these provenance on these? Much all been found in Aberdeenshire. Yeah, uh, there are approximately four hundred and fifty of these known from different sites. Pretty much, I, uh, there's a couple been found. Some of you might know. Do put it in the comments, folks, um, if you know, mm. um, because wasn't there one found in Ireland? Which was probably taken there, I'm, you know. Um, but the thing is, nobody knows what these are for. They're all, um, you know, they're called uh, carved balls. You can look at them. Okay, clearly some of them are. Uh, it's a leap to call them spherical, but they were spherical before they were carved out. Um, nobody knows what they're for. So that's three balls. Then there's yeah. um, um, five balls. There's five balls. Slightly less details. Slightly less. Well, a lot yeah. less ornate, uh, but still performing, if they had a function, performing the same one. Yeah. yeah. And, and Wildflower 0705, straight in there. I'm, I'm with Wildflower 05, uh, 0705. Mm. They are uh, bull balls. They are... It's, it's petonk, it's so they don't roll too yes. far. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Quite like uh, and uh, it's no accident that golf was invented up there as well. It's only after they started hitting these You'd with sticks. You'd need one hell of a club to hit that, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, but even <laughs> so. These are all, and, and it's worth knowing that these are all roughly the size of a tennis ball. Yeah. They're quite, they're quite big. Or um, the size of a petonk ball. Duh. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd say a little bit smaller than a petonk ball, but... Uh, Is it? Okay. Yeah. yeah, all right, but, and you know, the towie. There, there, right. And that's the towie. Now, I, I tell you what, folks, if you're interested, because you can Where see... Is Where is towie? Uh, is it Aberdeenshire? I think it's Aberdeenshire, but if, if you go to... Oh, lordy. I think it's National Museum Scotland. Um, I, I should find that link. But they've actually uh, done a complete 3D scan of this 
you can uh, you can go on their website and you can <laughs> rotate this completely so you can see it from all sides it is the i mean you look at the intricacy of that engraving on yeah. i don't know what that stone is actually it's not i suppose it could be obsidian um but that's I, I can't imagine how long that took to do it's it's but, stunning yes uh, and that i think um blows uh something um uh green dragon reprised uh said catapult shot he just wouldn't spend that much time uh, no, carving you, you something would you no you, you i don't wouldn't. think so um i, I must mm. admit that there were there have been um a few that i've wondered if um, if they could have been used as a mace um because if you if you actually yeah. wrapped thong around them in those grooves then it, it you know it would hold very securely uh, yeah. And so you could swing that and use it like a, a bowler uh, yeah. or whatever kind of weapon. And from that point of view, if you're keeping hold of it, then it's not a stretch because, you know, I mean, look at some of the swords that we've uh, seen yeah. through history yeah. where they've been acid etched and Lord knows what such incredible yes. workmanship. So maybe, but I do And think it's Sibylla point. asks, uh, do they need to have a use? Probably not. Therein lies our problem yeah, with interpretation. Been agonizing about this. I've been, uh, my wife and I have been agonizing about this. It's like what is, well, my wife thinks they're just uh, ornaments, but but my question is always, well, why are they only found in Aberdeenshire? Why yeah. you know why it, why was that? Not and as Pixie says, uh, uh, there's uh, at least them. one in situ on the Ness of Brogga in that's been uh, discovered in the uh, in the Ness yeah. ex excavation uh, up there as well. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we're not quite. We're sort of getting a little bit off because we just turned it into a conversation about. Um, That's true. About the, uh, about the, so, okay. All yeah, right. Then let's move on and balls, we'll say the balls. But, but we'll let us let us let us Stone bring balls, it back. It? Bring it back to something even wilder, really. Go on then. These are the Fulton drums. The, these are the Fulton drums. They're made of chalk. Yeah, and they're not as big as you'd think. No, the size of a pork pie. Yeah. Well, which one? Well, um, pork pies. <laughs> this, yeah, yeah, that would be a so very, it would be a big pork pie, the one on the right, but... Uh, yeah, I've we're, eaten we're one of each ballpark. of those sizes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, yes, I, 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 I'm with you, Michael. I think that they're weights rather than uh, measures. But um, the, these three were found in... Oh, heavens above, in Fulton in, uh, is it Yorkshire? Is Fulton in Yorkshire? I'm having a senior um, moment. I don't know oh if you gosh. remember off the top of my head. Uh, I'll um, bring us back on screen uh, while I uh, um, and, uh, and have then, a look. Uh, oh, sorry. And then another one has been found. Do you know what? This is something that irritates the hell out of me when it comes to uh, some archaeologists, that, um, that one has been found in a child's burial was buried with the body of a young girl and some archaeologists have said that they're associated with children they've only found they've been found in two sites and yeah. one of those with was associated with a child it doesn't make them associated um, with children no uh you, you are absolutely right yorkshire wolds Fulton is in the yorkshire wolds grand i wasn't having a senior well moment. done that man um, <laughs> um so yes, I mean they are the curious things to read up about because you know as I was saying earlier on that uh, they do if you wind a length of cord around them they Apparently. they are it, it, um, well I, I I don't have a reason to argue with that really I just think if they're uh, I mean you you can see how. You know, if they were weights, why? But why? Why? And what? Are, what are those carvings about? Those three were found as a set, um, and you can yeah, see the yeah. similarities in the engravings. Mm. Um, mm. It's and the, just, the, the dating gives them. They're estimated to be early Bronze Age. Mm between 2600 and 2000 BC. 
Lovely car. I love the I love the carving on them. I really do. Oh, uh, they're just they're gorgeous. And uh, now mm. the interesting thing is that the other um, example uh, that which was I don't found, have a picture of. No, um, it's not as uh, ornate it, at all, is it? it? It's not carved at all. No, it's completely plain. Um, mm. But it's the same dimensions as I can't remember which one of these. I think it's the larger one. But um, but mm. the thing is, it is the same dimension, which means that it was a standard thing. Um, and it makes sense that they were weights, what they would have been measuring mm, for mm, that. Mm. Who knows? Who knows? No. I'm sure we're missing lots, but I, I can't, th the nothing else came to my mind when uh, sort of thinking well, about this with question. With enigmatic earlier. objects? Yeah. Oh, what about the, what about the, the spectacles from Siberia? Oh, oh, the speckies. Uh, coming up on screen right now. <laughs> How okay, about now that? This is, this, this, well that is enigmatic. This, this is <laughs> should have gone to spec savers. <laughs> in, <laughs> this is from a burial in Siberia, um, <laughs> and and actually it was a double burial. There were two men uh, buried who they they've been called shamans of. Uh, a, not surprisingly, really, one of the men was uh, he, he was wearing this uh, headdress or or uh, or shoulder, very ornate thing, all made of birds, talons, and beaks. Um, and this chap buried alongside him had these, which seemed to be spectacles of some description. Um, and they have no idea. Is it a death mask? Is it that he was the he was the one who could see the? Uh, oh, I forgot. Uh, I, I, the I, could, I forgot or, I could do that. I can you? keep the picture. Oh, well done. On. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that that's enigmatic as hell, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah. What date do we was put on them? It's Bronze Age. It's Bronze, bronze Age. age. I, I yeah, can't yeah. actually remember. I can't actually remember a date on it, but. Um, I'd forgotten about those, but I think you've outdone yourself there. That's that's a that's a that's a goodie. That <laughs> yeah. is a goodie. Yeah, go on. That is so. Enigmatic. So, Pixie, I hope we're going in the right di direction uh, yeah. with with this. Did you have anything uh, uh, on your mind as uh, something for something enigmatic to share that we may have missed? There are loads. I'm sure we've come across. And I, you know. So often we come across stuff and think, oh, my Lord, that is so, that's ridiculous. What were they thinking? And then promptly forget about it. <laughs> Until yeah. it comes to yeah, times like this when we're, you know, sunglasses. Yeah. Uh, Matt is on point there, as usual. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> yeah, and the lens They'd work. long gone. Yeah. In, on, a, on a bright day, they would work very well. <laughs> Do you know what? Such a good example, though, of uh, of things that appear to be enigmatic until they're not, mm. um, uh, and that is uh, uh, one of the commonalities, uh, particularly down here in the south of France, uh, that something that was found a lot in burials was a single amber bead, and that seemed to be really enigmatic in itself. Why would you just put one? amber bead in a burial and then it was when we were with duncan garrow uh, who's uh, done a huge amount of uh, work with burials and uh, you know the, the treatment of the dead um, uh, in neolithic and bronze age and it's that they used shrouds and there would have been uh, not necessarily for the bodies it could have been that there was a bag that some of the grave goods were put in and it was a drawstring that had yeah. an amber bead on it. And, of course, over the years, the, the bag has long since rotted away, you know, completely gone, and the string, and all you're left with is the bead. It was a drawstring. Yeah. Oh, of course, it makes complete sense. We, uh, we must get Duncan back, you know. He's, we have uh, got to get He's Duncan a good lad, back. and he's, he's full of good yeah. stories. Um, yeah. David uh, Salisbury um, uh, asked the question, well... Uh, could it be a face mask that had rotted away, leaving the eyes or the frame of the eyes? Could be. Yeah, could well could be. be that. Yeah. As I say, pertinent to the point, you know, because often it's yeah. the stuff that's missing yeah. that leaves the enigma. You put back yeah. stuff, the back that's missing, and suddenly no enigma. Like a, like a stone circle, really. If you, 
Lord knows what we're missing that was there originally that uh, mm. would simply give us back the... Oh, of course that's what they were doing. Jeez, silly me. <laughs> How could I have missed it? <laughs> Dream on. <laughs> thank you so much, Pixie, and thank you for the uh, vote of confidence there. Okay. Um, mm. Shall I move on? Go on then. Jay Wilmer asks, uh, what was the most interesting fact stroke find that got you into your chosen interest? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, do you know what? I have to go a bit left field on this, if you'll forgive me, um, mm. because um, it, it wasn't anything to do with archaeology that got me interested in archaeology. It was uh, it, it was a fossil. Um and, and I, I took this one out of my uh, collection as an illustration because, uh, you know, it's it's a uh, wrong way, that way, that way. <laughs> it's because the camera's the other way around when we do these broadcasts and it's not a mirror anymore. Uh, and it was when I was about five years old uh, that uh, I... Did you see the from something? Tree Dude? No, I didn't. What did he say? What, it's going to be something in, <laughs> It was a spliff. <laughs> So as I was saying, I was about five, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. and I was in Dorset, and I, I just there you go. You're riffing. Up, you're uh, riffing on your own now. Focus on. Oh, I'm riffing on my own. Okay. Um, uh, I broke open a, a, a stone. I hit a stone with a stone, and there was an ammonite inside it. And it was very much like this is a trilobite, but. Um, uh, but, you know, you can imagine as a five-year-old, I'm going that way, as a five-year-old opening something and, and finding oh, that inside the stone. Fabulous. Um, that, this one's actually a fake ops. It's about 400 million years old, actually. How bonkers is that? But um, uh, but as a five-year-old, uh, you know, and my dad said, you're the first human being that's ever seen that. And mm. that, was, that was a moment. For me, and yeah. so ever since then, the enigmatic aspects of uh, of, of prehistory. You know, when um, when I started backpacking across Dartmoor and places like that, that you know, you're in the middle of nowhere, and suddenly you come across a whether it's a stone circle or a stone row or a, you know whatever it is, in the middle of nowhere, and it's just it's intoxicating when mm. you're you're just left with this it's it's this quiet space with you and it thinking mm. what mm. the hell um yeah that's right i i i never um found anything as spectacular as what you're holding in your hands there rupert but uh, uh having been posed this question and we get this question posed uh quite often but in different ways and it's interesting the way you've put this sort of brings up other things like uh, uh, Rupert's uh, um, trilobite and and to a large degree it, it feeds into you know what I when I was at primary school you know maybe when I was uh, eight nine whatever I was in a country uh, a little tiny village in Oxfordshire and um, we'd often be taken out, you know, on field trips just down the re just down the lane, and uh, there was an old uh, ironstone quarry there, and of course it was mm. rife with ammonites and, and things. So that thing of discovery of things in the ground that uh, needed explaining. Um, that uh, yeah, that's a good. Um, <laughs> Mm. It's, it's a good question differently put i mean people will know i've said answered the question before in other ways and you know a, a, a mm. trip to the roll right stones that my mum and dad took me on when i was uh, uh, mm. eight years old or, or so i think i was bewildered at the time you know there's nothing very exciting about uh, rocks and mm. fields but something stuck something stuck but there is something exciting about rocks and fields not Isn't when you're there? eight <laughs> well, not 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 intellectually when you're eight. You know, there's just something. It's just that you're left with what was that about? And so the the question never goes away. <laughs> At the time you're there, thinking, what are we doing here? 
And then you're afterwards, you're going, what were we doing? <laughs> mm. And mm. as long as that question remains unanswered. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's funny, though, that it's the, you know, it's like um, Pix's question about enigmatic objects that um, long before I was interested in archaeology, I, I was always passionate about geology and and i did collect a stupid amount of fossils and things as i went around mm. and when i used to go on digs with the natural history museum a long time ago and there, there are certain things that when you find them in situ um that you don't understand them at all and it takes somebody i do you know i went out there was a guy dr alan timms all hail he just changed my world with his understanding of reading the landscape and uh and when you get something that, uh, so like a worm burrow, so, you know, a, a worm that's a marine worm that's that's got a burrow under the soil. And, and over millions of years, it dies and the burrow fills with, uh, with well, you know, it, it, it fossilizes, it fills up with sediment and it, it fossilizes. And then over more millions of years, the surrounding rock turns into harder rock and it gets hollowed out again. And you can get a, like a three-stage fossil where the fossil has been fossilized and then what was around the fossil has been fossilized. Um, and it really takes somebody who knows what they're looking at to explain why you have this kind of tube within a tube within a tube within sure. a, you know. <clears throat> um, yeah. And, uh, I, yeah, I've got a few of those in my uh, in, in my boxes of rubble. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, welcome, uh, Stone Age Steve. I'm sorry you thought it was uh, 9 p.m., but uh, welcome anyway. That must mean it is 9 p.m. Uh, now, but I think in all the printed uh, Glad uh, everything you made it was, it. was pen um, sent out at uh, uh, eight, 8 o'clock. Um, the uh, prehistory flashes we've been doing have been at 9 o'clock, so I don't know if it's sort of confusing having one live at one time and uh, another live at another. But anyway, these welcome, these Steve. Stone Age so Steve has asked two questions, and I've allowed it this week, so we're just about to come up to his second one. We've uh -huh. already answered one, Steve. We're we just have, about Steve. to. We've done you already, mate. We've done you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, uh, Jay Wilmer, I hope um, I hope we've sort of answered your your question and it was interesting we found ourselves answering a sim the same question in different ways that uh, that time mm. oh look it's time for stone age steve bang yeah, on time <laughs> oh thereabouts <laughs> just before nine o'clock here we go right stone steve asks oh the creature oh, depicted steve beneath the bull yeah, beneath the bull on the yeah. base plate of gunderstruck cauldron is it the same creature as the most prominent carving of Gebekli Tepe, and if so, what is it? Mm. So, you know folks, I, I, yeah, the, the most important. Well, I've got. I made a composite it, of both of them, Rupert. Oh, did you? Well done. So I'll, I'll put um, that up, shall I? Yeah. Well, I thought that there must be a lot of people who actually don't know what the gun, the Gunderstrup uh, uh, cauldron is. Um, it's. It was found. Uh, not surprisingly, it was found in Gunderstrup uh, in Denmark. And uh, the cauldron itself is extraordinary. And uh, now that, um, well, that motif on the right, uh, that's a bull with um, a, a woman uh, over the top, supposedly, um, holding a sword. So it's the woman that's fighting the bull. I'd say looking at the size of that bull that it's an aurochs, not a bull. But um, uh, mm. but it, there, there, are, there are hunting dogs all around it. Uh, and then there is this, uh, this creature at the bottom. I think it's meant to be a dog, Steve. I, do you know what? I, I was really, um, uh, you know... <laughs> I was impressed that you made the connection, actually, because I, I can <laughs> completely see what you're talking about with uh, with the one. Um, you know, if you look on the the pillar there with this uh, uh, amazing, I, I don't know what that creature is. And the trouble is with the stylized no yeah. uh, approach that it could be 
any number of things. Now, bearing in mind that these are approximately 9,000 years apart. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like that. So, yeah. um, uh, you know, so, and, and obviously, the, the, you know, one in Turkey and one in, uh, in Denmark. So, uh, you know, separated by time and distance uh, in the extreme. Yes. Um, the, the, the connections know, I, are, I, I, are, are tenuous I, I, apart from the resonances yeah. that they yeah. share. Yeah. I, I don't think What's that the creature down creature? the bottom left, though? Is that, uh, is it, that looks like a pig or a wild boar or something. Yeah, I, I, uh, the, um, the listing of it, because if you, if you look at the Gebekli Tepe uh, data, they actually list this as a lizard with a warthog. Now, yeah. I say lizard my ass. Um, it, you want to see the teeth on it. Um, oh. It's uh, uh, th There's no way that's a lizard. Um, I, th I don't know. I don't know what it is. It, it, take your pick. Take your pick. It could be a badly drawn boy. It could be a, ba it could be a badly drawn lion. No, it's got too long a tail. It could be a badly drawn crocodile. No, it couldn't be a badly yeah. Well, a as pick. we say, uh, Steve, top marks for uh, figuring for out. The spot, to, yeah. uh, for the spot, yeah. For the spot, yeah. Have you got, just just so that people who don't know what the Gunderstruck cauldron is, have you got the picture there of the cauldron itself? I could have it up in a jiffy, I think. Uh, I just think it's worth people uh, seeing, if they're not familiar with it, Quite I've, I've only got that image that you sent me um, on its own. So, I, I sent you, the, oh, did you? I sent you one of the cauldron earlier on. I'll hold. Um, but oh, no I missed it. I'm so sorry. I don't. Then I can't. I can't no, do right. that. Okay, um, you can. Uh, you can always uh, Google it. Gunderstrop. Yeah. It's G U N D E R S T R O P. Um, mm. And uh, it's just, it's, it's a fairly big cauldron. If you could go to the museum in Denmark, the cauldron is in this massive glass case. It's, uh, you know, I, I don't know why they don't have a 360 degree 3D model of it that you could uh, scan around. They should. <laughs> um, but the engravings on it are of um, animals, uh, some very, uh, well, you know, I mean, this, it looks like Hearn the Hunter or uh, something similar, surrounded by dogs. There's a man with antlers, cross-legged. You know, yeah. I'm saying Hearn the Hunter. I don't know what other people think he is. Um, just the carvings, and uh, it's stunning. It, absolutely breathtaking. Uh, look at that. We used to have uh, a that, hamster. Um, we used to have a hamster. We called him Hearn the Hamster. Of course you did. Carry on, carry on. <laughs> Back in the room. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, I think uh, I think we've gone round the I houses. I don't know if you've answered uh, your question, Steve. No, I don't think it's the same animal, but good spot. <laughs> <laughs> Top marks, we say. Yes. Uh, Dioman, you're here tonight. Let's move on to your um, uh, question. Oh, here's a good one. Yeah, where, what and where is the earliest known evidence of native ironwork in the British Isles? Do you know what, Dioman, that is such a good question, and it's such yeah. a good question for so many reasons. I don't know how much effort you'd put into trying to find it. It's almost impossible to find information, because if you look up... Uh, uh, any Iron Age metalwork. <laughs> I've You've upset people no with Hearn the Hamster. Uh, and Pixie <laughs> says, wait, I need closure on hamster, the hamster anecdote. <laughs> no, you don't, because you don't want to know what happened to Hearn the Hamster. Yeah, hamsters, nothing ever good that comes from My lips are sealed. Hamsters. Yes, Kevin, <laughs> Hearn the ham Hearn, Hearn, yeah. with an E. No, not Herm. <laughs> H-E-R-N-E. Hearn the Hunter, yes. Sorry, anyway, uh, iron uh, <laughs> evidence of um, native ironwork. Yes, so if you, uh, if you actually search for Iron Age metalwork, or iron, even if you search for Iron Age iron 
wrought iron, forged iron, what you'll find is Iron Age gold. You will find hardly any information about iron. And so um, in order to answer your question, Jorman, we contacted uh, a number of uh, friends in the archaeological fraternity. Um, mm -hmm. Nearly all of them couldn't answer the question at all because um, – they're working earlier in prehistory and had the same information. But the we guy did. who so, could answer the question is not an archaeologist, yeah. but he is an no. expert, that's for sure. He really Tom is an expert. Tom Timbrell. Yep. Uh, Tom Timbrell, he's... Uh, some of you may have seen the interview we did with Tom and his partner Caroline. They do yeah. Iron the Age. The podcast was called Living in the Iron Age. Mm. Um, and his uh, Caroline, uh, yeah. fascinating interview and um tom yeah he knows so much about the iron age and he actually sent through a very uh handy answer and in a nutshell this is what he said the earliest evidence of iron working in britain comes from agricultural tools there are selections of axes and sickles that, although iron, are socketed and made in a style mimicking that of their bronze predecessors. Mm. The similarity between the iron and bronze tools is uncanny and incredibly interesting, as forging them in such a way is far more difficult than more conventional styles. Uh, there are examples from Wales dated 800 to 600 BC. Uh, and they've been found alongside bronze artifacts. Uh, so it's it's a very interesting point, that isn't it? That even though the technology had moved on, so they had a metal yeah. that was a lot stronger, people still wanted them to look like their familiar bronze tools. That's, and this picture uh, kind of tells the tale, really, doesn't it? Mm. Which, uh, well, it, it's a piece of work. Look at that. Yeah. Now, we're not saying this is the oldest um, evidence of iron uh, artefact in, uh, in, in, in Britain, but it's one of the oldest, and it, uh, it tells yeah. that story of people things being made out of iron, but in the style of a Bronze Age artefact, mm. and in the style of a, of a, a Bronze Age. Uh, uh, yeah, and it, it, uh, just interesting aspect of this, uh, which might be slightly um, off point for the question, but that actually had the remains of, uh, or some remains of the shaft inside the handle, and the, the shaft was mm. uh, was made of ash wood. Um, and it's it's when you you know you look at the, that the hole there, the socket hole that had a, a rivet of some description going through it. You know, mm -mm. We haven't changed, have we? We're, do we have an exactly actual date doing. on this? Uh, do we have an actual date on, on this piece, Rupert? No, but it's going to be there, there or thereabouts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's listed in the museum. This is from uh, National Museums Wales, yeah. and it's listed in their catalogue as early Bronze Age. Um, sorry, early Iron Age. So... Um, so it, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's going to be around the uh, six, seven hundred BC mark. So two things uh, spring up from here. Uh, this and and one is that it's this is not confined to metalwork. The idea of um, uh, uh, iron, iron iron artifacts being made in the style or the older style of a bronze artifact. Because this happened with stone and flint. Mm. I think if you, there are quite a few museums you can go to where there are examples of this, where uh, after a polished stone axes of jadeite or uh, um, Langdale axes, that kind of thing, those kind of precious stone things, they started being mimicked in flint. Mm. So you got a... <clears throat> That's kind of a reverse order thing, but where you've got something where the style was so admired that it's been reproduced in an old, in what mm. you'd sort of term, if you were sort of obeying the rules of the three age system, in what you think was mm. an older uh, um, uh, material. 
but well, the, it, but some of the like flint, a... some of the flint axes are extraordinary. When you think, yeah. I bet they didn't even know they could do that with flint before they tried. <laughs> before yeah. they'd seen seen a, well, a polished stone axe, and thought, oh. <laughs> I think it's the equivalent of a of a Neolithic knockoff Rolex. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know that uh, even you know coming back to the Iron Age. You look at uh, when we were talking with Tess uh, Mackling about the talks that you get the solid gold ones that are just yeah. unbelievably valuable, and then you could have the cheapskate ones that were just the thinnest coating of gold, and they were actually filled with, uh, and the gold was on, you know, maybe a, a bronze something underneath. But it was completely hollow, and they were filled with wax to give them the same weight as the gold. That's and right. Just cheap That's right. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. But so, I can yeah. best all of this Go if on. you, if we're talking about the evidence. I have, I think, got the oldest evidence for a metal uh, thing in in Britain, and it's not the thing itself. It's uh, a cut mark in one of the post holes oh, well at Durrington <laughs> Walls. Now, I'm afraid I couldn't get a bit better picture for you, but this is from uh, a paper that was published in uh, PAST, which is the journal of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the Prehistoric Society. Um, um, and the numbers 1, 2, and 3 there are marks made by uh, sort of an axe-like uh, shaped head um, at the, uh, used as an adz for, for, for hitting down on the outside of the, uh, the post hole. Those have been analysed and the, they can only have been made by a thin-bladed uh, axe head or adz head um, with a sh very sharp uh, uh, edge. Uh, and it's reckoned that they must have been uh, made of metal, whatever, whether they were copper adzes or uh, bronze adzes. But the thing is here, we're at Dunnington Walls, we're talking late Neolithic. Mm. And uh, you don't uh, you know, really get, a, get copper stuff uh, showing up uh, you know, until we get the beaker burials you know, in the same vicinity. <laughs> mm. uh, l later on, but it is fascinating the possibility of uh, you know some kind of crossover going on, or um, uh, materials or tools being introduced into uh, southern Britain and being used at uh, Durrington Walls in this way. It does make you Oops. wonder, you know, at what period down the line, you know, was it repair? That's work? good, that isn't yeah. it? Do you, do you, that was uh, I like that one though. It was it's food, food for thought, yeah. that one. <laughs> a, 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 definitely a good find because, uh, you know, any of the sites that were in use for, you know, a thousand years or, or, or whatever, you know, that there would have been repair work that needed doing mm. on a regular mm. basis. So, yeah. Mm. Excellent. Anyway, uh, thank you for the mm. question. As ever, Dilman, um, good to see mm. you around. Uh, we've got three more questions to go. I suppose we'd better think about getting a move on. Get a pedal on, yes. Yes, indeed. Um, Anne, Anne Jones, uh, your opinion, Ari, the possibility of as few as 70 survivors from the Ice Age in Europe left to repopulate Earth. The full question was a bit longer than that, but Mm. That's the, 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 the gist of it. Um, yes. I, I, I'm not sure where you got um, your figure from there, Anne. Um, the, the, the current thinking is that uh, the, the population was around 400,000 uh, individuals um, after the Ice Age, um, which, uh, which makes more sense to me really um uh yeah i mean you know you you can uh, you know do the numbers backwards can't you to find uh, population sizes generally but they they tend to be bigger than than people imagine um as i said mm. i'm not sure where you got the, the the figure of 70 from but um yeah current thinking is between 350 and 400,000 people 
I mean, is, it, uh, is that a genetic extrapolation? Can... That's the important thing, you know, where this number comes from. Did you say, is it a genetic extrapolation? I, well, that, I, that was the question actually... I asked, and, uh, you know, not having been able to find uh, uh, anything. Um, Perhaps you can point us in the right direction, there, Anne, if you're around. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a paper written by, hold on a second... Um, I've got the abstract in front of me. Um, it's written by a French and Norwegian. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I mean, that, that's not to say though, that there haven't been some serious bottlenecks in human history, but that, I think uh, mm -hmm. the, the numbers, you know, the approximate numbers for those bottleneck uh, uh, times have been extrapolated from uh, genetic studies. Um, mm. So, uh, the, yeah. The, uh, I'm not going to read you the whole abstract here, but just to give you a very brief uh, nutshell, it says, uh, dynamics of the human population in Europe from 30,000 to 13,000 years ago can be simulated using ethnographic and paleoclimate data with the climate envelope modeling approach. Correspondence between the population simulation and archaeological data suggests that population dynamics were indeed driven by major climate fluctuations, with yeah. population size varying between 130 and 410,000 people. Although climate has been an important determinant in human population dynamics, the climatic conditions during the last glacial were not as harsh as is often presented because even during the coldest phases, yeah. the climatically suitable area for humans covered 36% of Europe. Yeah, yeah. I think Ralph um, uh, nail, uh, knocks it on the head here. Ralph Ellis uh, regards 70 survivors, a million can survive, but if later generations are all descended from just the 70 within that population, it will appear as if only 70 survived or mm. were around at that That's time. Great point, Ralph. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, uh, and it, it, yeah, it's a salutary. Uh, point when uh, looking at the numbers. We have to be very careful. A very, very careful. Interesting study, that genetic thing. I wish I understood m more about it. Um, and, uh, mm. Maybe we should get somebody on who understands a bit more about it than we do. Well, yes. I mean, that would be getting Tom back again, Well, that it? would be getting Tom back again, wouldn't he? He could speak <laughs> to this, can we? Shall we ring yeah, him up? He <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit late, really. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tom Booth, we're talking about uh, Dr. Tom Booth, who we did. Yeah, we did. Uh, we, we did, we did yeah. a, a good interview with him uh, quite recently. He's fascinating, but to speak to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, check it out. It's uh, uh, down in the timeline somewhere on the channel um, somewhere. So, thank you for the the, the question, uh, Anne. But I'm I'm sorry we couldn't really. Um, Really get dive down to I think the nub of the question that you were uh, you, you were asking there. If we've got it wrong, we've mis we've misconstrued what you're trying to uh, ask us. Please uh, don't f uh, please ask the question again. <laughs> um, mm. Some other question. Jim says, "What was the average age of death in the Neolithic?" Which is I suppose it is relevant, <laughs> isn't it? It was uh, uh, considerably younger. Uh, we believe, you know, mm. it was. 40s yeah i mean it's still not uh it's still not that young really yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. from what people say it is a, uh, it's, it, you know that's a really good topic we should uh, touch on mm. some other but i think we should move on for the time being we'll move on mm. to rowan's uh question interesting one rowan um f if you can read this i had to squish it down um, to fit it on the screen. How far was the extent of maritime archaic peoples? I understand that they hugged the coast of Spain to Canada, we can talk about that, and could possibly be the forebearers of the Clovis peoples. I also learned that um, populations, is that populations? Yes, it is. I also it, learned that monkeys made it to South America by accident before humans on a plant-based raft with fruit trees attached. Real science. And humans didn't have the means until Columbus. Is that still serious prehistory? No. Well, it's, um, <laughs> uh, it's a whole uh, load of stuff that needs unpicking there, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, in a nutshell. I mean, yeah, because this is... Uh, we're actually doing... 
a, a, a whole chunk on this in the yeah. next podcast that'll be out uh, this month. The Maritime um, Adventures of Prehistoric Human Beings, in other words, yes. Indeed, yes. Um, so it's it's interesting that you would ask uh, the question this month. Um, so what to pick out here in particular? The, the fact that um, Europeans going from Spain to Canada could have been forebears of the Clovis people. Uh, yes, that's Bruce Bradley's uh, salutary and hypothesis. And, and again, we point you to our um, interview with him um, from... Yes. What was it? Uh, last indeed. year, uh, last um, year, wasn't Bruce, it? We're, we're going to get Bruce on again soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's very keen to come back on and have another chat. Yes. Um, so in a nutshell, um, the, the thing about uh, Spain to Canada, um, if you go back to the uh, just after the glacial maximum, um, so the ice sheets went from not not quite down into Spain, but certainly from southern France right across to uh, New England. So if people did just follow the ice sheets, you know, you, they could have slept on the ice and hunted seals and fish during the day. They, yeah. People could easily have got to um, uh, to uh, you know New England and Connecticut places like that. Uh, mm. And it and, wouldn't have been done uh, in the sense of a voyage. This is the point, I think, about no, understanding no the Clovis hypothesis. The, the same way that the Inuit hunt today. Yeah, s- during, spread al- uh, you just spread along the coast. You spread along yeah. the coast. And as long as you can um, hunt, uh, you can get um, uh, the, carbohydrates uh, and <laughs> fats and proteins out of the ocean yeah, around you. Uh, and there's you're going to there's be all sorts of, of compelling... Um, evidence for that, not least of all, that um, only one tribe in the Americas, the Ojibwe tribe, uh, actually have DNA which can be tracked back to um, what is now modern-day Europe. And uh, that means that people did come across, they because the, the tribe actually although they've spread across the whole of the states now, they originally were in the northeast. Uh, and, you know, if you did go straight across the ice sheet, you would end up in uh, New England. And there are some megalithic sites up in that part of the world uh, and none across on the west. So, you know, you have to start asking questions. Mm, uh, mm, so that's mm. one thing. Uh, so that that's uh, the first bit of the question. Monkeys made it to South America by accident before humans on a plant-based raft. We don't even need to go there. Peoples have been in, uh, in the Americas for many, many, many thousands of years. In fact, uh, recent evidence from Mexico pushed the dates of humans in the Americas back to 30,000 years ago. Um, and but this, is, you know, this isn't human prehistory, though. Um, mm. The actual fact of this is a, a new one on me, mm. that um, uh, monkey species show that there was a, a, yeah. a, 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 um, a zoological prehistoric, uh, you know, zoological prehistorical thing that the monkeys mm. must have got gotten from Africa mm. to South America uh, mm. somehow. Uh, the timing yes. of which, uh, at the time of which this must have happened, the seas were f- much more contracted, but it was still apparently a thousand kilometers that they would have to have traversed. Uh, but this I, hypothesis. I don't, have a, I don't have a date though for um, uh, for the you know <laughs> genetic tracking of you know how long have uh, have those monkey species been in the Americas because uh, you know monkeys per se uh, you know have been around for a very long time. Uh, you know, the modern day monkeys are descended from, you know, in the same way as we all are, you know. So where they came from when uh, when sea levels have, have varied enormously over, say, the last few million years. Uh, so they could have got there on plant-based rafts, but when? Uh, and if it was at a time when sea levels, you know, take the glacial maximum as an example. Sea levels were in some places 100 metres lower, even more. 
Oh, um, yeah. Because yeah. of the, the amount of ice that was locked up in the polar caps. And that meant that there are places like, uh, you know, going down through Australasia, Indonesia, where you could have just walked down if, uh, well, if humans had been around at the time. Uh, you could have just walked down. So for species to uh, go somewhere, you know, accidentally uh, by a raft of, you know, of, uh, of vegetation. Well, the, the yeah, the hype, this, this thing is, uh, we're talking about 40 million years ago. There this you go. This is supposed to have happened, um, yeah. Uh, so there's all sorts of possibilities in there that we can't really uh, I wanted, talk really I, but, about. But one thing I do want to clear up, that, uh, sort of implied by what Rowan says, uh, and that's when mm. he, his use of the re term real science in inverted I commas. Think, I think he's referring to, there's a website called Real Science. I don't think oh, he's, right. Oh, I, I see I, what you I, mean. I don't think he's saying that this is real science. I think he's saying, I think he's quoting real science. I beg his um, pardon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was going to say, because there is the science bit of, you know, zoology yeah. and prehistory and archaeology and yeah. there's the supposition and the uh, story making yeah. bit of <laughs> both yeah, the, no, that, that's my disciplines I, I thought yeah yeah he yeah was, okay he was pardon. quoting a, a research course <clears throat> um but um you know i mean there <sighs> there are just okay so looking at people traveling uh generally looking at people traveling in uh, uh, maritime travel in prehistory, that there has been recent research about uh, the seagoing explorers in, uh, in the islands uh, south of Japan. Yep. And it was always presumed, because people have been on these islands for 35,000 years, Hmm. And it was always presumed that, uh, the, the same as the uh, monkeys on uh, rafts of vegetation, that they got there by accident, that they yeah. were swept there in storms and what have you. But uh, research has shown that that's not the case. If you were in whatever kind of storm, that the prevailing currents in those waters would always take you away from the islands, not towards them. And yeah. they've done that research coming from the south, coming from the north, there's no way you could have got there by accident. Yeah. Um, so in a nutshell, people 35,000 years ago were setting out yeah. deliberately to get to somewhere yeah. they couldn't actually see. Awesome. Yeah. Respect. It is. It's just <laughs> so brave. Um, yeah. And then there's more recent research that's about the peopling of the Caribbean islands, uh, also really fascinating because it was always presumed that uh, that uh, that the islands were populated from the south going north because you can come off the coast of south america where you've got trinidad and tobago which you know you could swim to it if you didn't want mm -hmm. a boat or if you mm -hmm. didn't have a boat uh, so and you could have then island hopped gradually making your way north but actually the oldest settlements are on the northern islands which you can't see yeah, yeah. Um, uh, B. Uh, Griffin uh, asks, Brian, I think it is, isn't it? Yes, Brian asks, are we talking about the Ryukyu Islands? Yes, we are. We are talking about the Ryukyu Islands. Indeed, we yeah. are. Um, yes. Um, Excellent. Well spotted. Um, but in the, um, in the Caribbean, as I said, you know, the, the oldest settlements are on the Northern Islands, which, you know, as Mike said, these people are setting out to sea uh, when they can't see land. Well, they were probably, you know, they saw birds flying over that way and disappearing over the horizon, you know, and saying, well, there must be something over there. The birds wouldn't be going nowhere. Yeah. Uh, that's still a, that's a very bold, <laughs> very bold thing to do. But they did. Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. so uh, northern settlements on in the Caribbean 7,000 years ago, gradually progressing to uh, two and a half thousand years ago in Antigua and Barbuda. <laughs> Who who was it made the point? It's one of you Patreon lot made the point uh, when we were talking about this on uh, on last Thursday uh, that one possibility would be if the cloud if the uh, if the uh, climate was in a certain way that uh, clouds could uh, point out mm -hmm. could um, help you discern whether the who did make that point? There was were. a point. 
it was a point well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but i think uh, i think we should round that up with you know that general point of that we're going to a you know part of the next podcast is going to be uh, about that which of course will be a video version up here um we we, would address this very question really so with that said i think we should move on and i see that kev riley is still with us (laughs) <laughs> which is a good job because we're about to uh, answer your question, Kev, which is, in the past, every facet of our lives was dictated by religion. There was no dividing line between the everyday practical reality and the religious life. What practical use could be attributed to stone circles and curses? How long have you got? Kev didn't ask that. I asked that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. How long have uh, you Kev, got? I appreciate your question was slightly longer than that, but I think I've got the uh, the essence uh, uh, of it there. Yeah. Um, this is actually, uh, some of you will know, this is actually one of our big um, topics of research that's on a, uh, in the background being developed all the time. It's uh, It's something we've been working on for a long time. Um, what practical use could be attributed to stone circles and curses? Well, it's it's more enclosures than stone circles, really. Yeah. Um, but uh, certainly curses and enclosures, uh, it, much more to do with livestock and controlling of animals. Ditches and banks are very good ways of controlling animals. Um, animals will avoid ditches and... Uh, uh, yes, there's a finger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> Do you know what this question can be answered really, really concisely if we make an analogy? And that is agricultural showgrounds. There are many up and down uh, the country, some small ones, big ones. Most of the time they're redundant. Mm. Nothing's happening there. They're they're there for their permanency so that you can arrive there and there's already a structure there for managing of people and the management of animals and all the Mm. other things that go along with it. Mm. There, I've said it, job done. Okay, I'll go with that. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? I do, absolutely, I do. I think that's, uh, that's a perfectly reasonable analogy to uh, uh, to use as well. And it really um, came home strongly to me because a few months ago I went up to uh, Thornborough Henges, which are uh, up in Yorkshire, which I'd never been to before. You know, the three uh, huge henges uh, in a, in a line, or even uh, resembling uh, Orion's Belt, laid out in the scheme of Orion's Belt in the landscape there. And uh, you know, not far from um, Thornborough, uh, Thornborough Henges, is the Great Yorkshire Showground. And if you get an aerial view of the Great Yorkshire Showground, you'll see, what, three, four enclosures, you know, all joined uh, uh, together, and the ancillary stuff going on that makes sense of them. And, of course, those enclosures are to do with containing... Animals and displaying animals in uh, in, uh, in one way or another. So, mm. you know, I think if, if we you don't want know, to... we don't we don't know. But it, uh, the, the the similarities make it a, a, a yeah, really nice I, I avenue think, to pursue. I think. Uh, well, I think you know we we could add to it slightly by pointing out that one of the uh, aspects of research that we're pursuing on this is that if you go over to um, but much further in the east to uh, particularly the Stans, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, they have forever, they have um, had saiga traps, uh, the type of antelope. And the saiga traps are ditches and banks, but they're these sweeping shapes, sweeping curved shapes that go across the landscape. And the thing is that over in the Stans, this is open, uh, you know, it's just, desert it's just open land forever and so the curved nature is so that the animals when they're being chased they will follow the curve they don't want to tumble in the ditch they're being chased in a way that's pushing them in towards the ditch 
And when they get the opportunity to jump through a gap in the uh, in the bank, they'll take it because it's a means of escape. That uh, as soon as they do that, then they're driven into the more enclosed aspects of the trap. These big sweeping curved shapes. Now, when you come over to Britain and you look at a cursus, which is just a rectangular shape, which is you know a ditch on the outside and it's got the bank, and every now and again there's a gap in the bank. The function is exactly the same. It's just the shape that's different. And why would the shape be different? It's because the topography is different. You're chasing animals through forest and uh, and across scrubland. You're not chasing them across desert. Yep. So and you're probably, um, probably, I just say this, you'll have to talk to somebody who's used to animal husbandry in this way. You're probably leeching them to a certain degree out of their habitat, out of the, um, uh, the, the woods. I don't know that this is... You know, all our research will be channeled into finding these mm. kinds of things out. Um, yeah. uh, but we I have mean, there found... There are so many aspects of, yeah. uh, you know, going up into the north, you know, the uh, caribou and, uh, and reindeer hunting the way it's been done uh, by indigenous peoples for as long as we know. Um, and it all points to the same sort of thing. Yeah. You know, to say yeah. that a cursus, for example, the traditional notion that they're processionary pathways, um, th that to say that, well, why do you want one? You know, okay, so you've got one that's a hundred meters long, and then you've got one that's how you know how long is the Dorset three miles cursus? long, six three miles. miles why do you want a three mile processionary pathway? Stop it. Um, yeah. uh, but in uh, so many places where there are cursuses, there are cursuses. There are many of them. Yeah, there's over 60 um, as, in we've ex as we've explored uh, in uh, the first prehistory show. <laughs> uh, I ventured yeah. just down the road. There's a um, uh, cursus, there was a cursus, um, barely half a mile from where I'm sitting now. Beyond that, there's mm. another cursus. Uh, there's a mile to the north mm. of that, there's another cursus. Uh, things. There aren't <coughs> that many yeah. churches around, and there were less people then. Why would you need so many processionary pathways to you mm. know, accommodate far, far fewer people? Yeah, um, yeah that's the thinking. And there are, we're, we're finding more and more correlations between uh, what we think uh, curses as were before and in um, the contemporary landscape. Yes. Mm. Um, there you go. Yeah, so watch this space as far as that, that is concerned. Um, you can tell the way our minds think, can't you? We're beginning to get a get an idea. <laughs> mm. And with that, we hope, uh, uh, Kev, um, that uh, that is your question answered for tonight. We've been talking for one minute thirty, uh, one hour thirty seven minutes and twenty seconds. Have as we? far and as I can tell, I there, think we should honestly. be thinking of uh, winding this evening up. I've really enjoyed this. Um, mm. Yeah, Martin says Stonehenge has two curses. Yes, one little one, uh, uh, one, uh, one, one big one across the top. Oh, yeah, an interesting mm. point about curses, is, of course, is that uh, people coming hundreds of years after in the Bronze Age and what have you probably were as mystified by them as anybody else. So I thought of them as, as special because at Stonehenge, of course, you've got uh, a barrow at one end of them and, uh, and um, uh, tumuluses along, along the sun. Tumuluses? Tumuli. Tumuli. I don't know. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and kissed them. So, uh, using that ground to, to honour it without, uh, as we don't, uh, understanding what the prime um, purpose was. Anyway, mm. we'll articulate that a lot better uh, some other time in the future. In the mm. meantime, it's been a deep pleasure to have your company this evening, uh, folks. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else I want to p point you in the direction of. There was something I was thinking of a moment ago, and it's gone out of my mind. Uh, I'm sure it, uh, it can't be that important. So, uh, anything well, you need to be... Uh, hmm? Anything you need to say, Rupert? <laughs> Sorry. I was just going to say, keep an eye out on the community for the next call for questions. Uh, we'll oh, get, yeah. Uh, we'll get one up in the next couple of days. And uh, uh, and we will do this again in a month's time. Yeah. 
Uh, excellent. Uh, anything coming up that we just need to remind people about uh, that, that we've got? Uh, that we'll be doing something in the next few days. Uh, we'll be doing a news flash or something in we the will. next few days. Um, I'm not going to tell you what that's about, though. Um, no, the next solid thing, uh, interview uh, uh, that we have coming we're out. Interviewing, is with we're interviewing Kenny Brophy uh, next Brophy. week. Uh, um, him. Brophy. And, <laughs> and we've, got, um, uh, we, we've got our recent interview with Amanda Hart of the Corinthian Museum, uh, which we'll, you will be getting uh, this month as well, which uh, that's one to look forward to. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking forward to releasing that. Thank you so much, folks, uh, for being with us and uh, for your support. If you haven't already done so, do like and subscribe and uh, and take a look at mm. the, the Patreon page. There are uh, several ways of uh, of supporting, uh, <laughs> keeping us keeping our <laughs> life and living yes. together. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. Yes, we need your support and we really appreciate it. So, uh, uh -huh. thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Till the next time, folks, I'm just about to press the blue finish button, and that's it. Five, four, three, two, one.